It's my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Professor Ruth Armitage from Eastern Michigan University. Uh, Professor Armitage is an expert in archaeological chemistry, and today she is going to tell us how she investigates artifacts from ancient from ancient health. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Michael. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, Saturday morning, um, I'm not sure I can get this many students to show up for class on a Saturday morning. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing. Um, right on my left, oh, I gotta remember. I'm used to talking loud for a lecture. It's not used to using a microphone, but since the recording requires that, I have to turn that on. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've done on um, some Peruvian textiles. And all of this has been in collaboration with um, a variety of different museums. And I'll even throw in just a little bit of Ohio content in the middle. So we'll do a little deviation from Peru to Ohio to give you an example. So before I really get started, I want to make sure that everybody is aware that there are um, drawings, but not photographs, of mummified human remains in this presentation, just so that everyone's aware of that. So um, the Society of American Archaeology which is the biggest organization for archaeologists in North America, talks about this definition of archaeology and how it allows us to delve into the past to understand people. And they use this word analysis of things. Okay, So analysis means one thing to archaeologists, which is often about counting artifacts or evaluating how they are distributed within a site and things like that. I'm a chemist, though, so analysis to me means something very different. And so um, I'm going to be using chemistry to try and answer questions that archaeologists or um, conservation scientists bring to me. So we can call this archaeological chemistry, but really it's just analytical chemistry applied to archaeological questions. And so um, the questions that archaeologists bring to us can range from how old is this rock painting? And these are some projects that I worked on as a graduate student. Um, when I did my PhD at Texas a and we were studying charcoal pigmented rock paintings and trying to measure their age. Um, some other questions are where did the bricks to build this chapel come from? And so my first academic job was in St. Mary's County, Maryland, and they have the 1666 chapel. Well, this is all that was left of it was the foundations. They wanted to know more about the composition of the bricks. So we used analytical chemistry to try and answer those questions. Um, this was a project that to me feels recent, but 10 years ago feels like last week anymore. I don't know what the problem is there. But um, these are some paintings in um, Cuba. And we got to go to Cuba to work with Cuban archaeologists to try and determine how old the paintings were in um, some of the caves there in Cuba. So all of this seeks to better understand people, what people were doing, how they were doing things in the past. So it comes back to it's always about people. So uh, the main topic for today is the materials of ancient Peru. And so we're going to talk about textiles and dyes. So, Here's a nice, fluffy, he's a llama, um, walking around in the Altiplano in Peru. So when we talk about textiles, the textiles of Peru are incredibly long lived. So people have been making textiles in Peru for thousands of years, and when there was no written language, these textiles carried information to you know, the rest of the group of the people. So they communicated information, they were beautiful and artistic, and I want to show you sort of, so that you can get a feeling for how intensive this um, production of some of these textiles was. So first we have to sort of orient ourselves in space and time. Um, since we don't have a TARDIS, we'll have to use an app. Behind and so we are looking here at um, mostly the cultures of the coast of Peru. So when we look at this through time, we start back here in the formative period. The most important site here is Huaca Prieta. So Huaca Prieta has the earliest evidence of woven textiles um, that have ever been found to contain indigo dye. And those are 6,000 years old. 
that's older than Egyptian pyramids. That's really far longer back. And so, you know, this is new world. New, new world, okay. So um, we, we look at the um, archaeology of Peru through not just distribution north-south, but also up. So as we move up through the mountains, um, from the coastal, dry coastal regions into the more temperate highlands, and then um, into the real highlands where you're getting into um, the Indian mountains. So the ones that I highlighted in red here are the ones that we're going to see examples of today. So the oldest of these is the Paracas, and this is down here in this region. Um, then followed by the Nazca, and most of these styles or attributions or cultures are basically just who was the most dominant in this area at this time. After the Nazca, the Wari came in and sort of took over everything. This was the Wari Empire, um, spreading from the central coast all the way into the South Highlands. And then later we have the Moche and the Sikan. The Sikan is also sometimes called La Baike, and so I'll show you a textile of that from that site. And then finally, the materials that we have go to the Chankai. So if you look at this, everybody thinks, oh, Peru, South America, Inca, there's thousands of years of history in Peru that predate the Inca. All right, so let's start with the oldest one, which is Caracas. And this is a picture of the Paracas Peninsula. Um, gosh, I don't remember where this picture came from, but um, the most important site here is um, the necropolis of Wari Kayam. And this was excavated in the 1920s by the native Peruvian archaeologist Julio Teo. And Teo was actually trained at Harvard and went back to basically found indigenous Peruvian archaeology. In these sites in Caracas, they found these elaborate mummy bundles in shaft tubes. So I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like, again, drawings of these things. And nearly all of these have been transferred to the National Museum in Lima, where they still reside. Now, many of these models were split up. Some of them were sold. Some of them were looted and removed. Um, they're distributed throughout the world. And um, there's a lot of history behind that. There's a lot of um, information sort of missing in some of these textiles as well. So this is what these look like. This is um, one of the shaft tombs. And you can see that this was dug down and then an opening, and these are the steps to get in. The mummy bubbles were placed inside of the shaft tube and usually sort of piled on top of each other. So um, the largest one in the middle and the smaller ones around and on top. And within the mummy bubbles, we have the um, person's remains, which were sitting in a field position inside of a basket, often tied with cord to keep them in that position. And then objects were placed around it, offerings of food, feathers, more textiles, clothing, jewelry, and then the layers of textiles. So a plain layer as a shroud, and then these incredibly decorative layers over and over. The largest of the mummy bundles um, from Wari Kayan had, I think it was, 100 different layers of textiles within it, and it was big. These were huge, huge bundles in some cases. So this is one of them. This is Teo and um, one of his colleagues. And since these were excavated in the 1920s and it wasn't color photography, instead they had a watercolorist painting each of the layers as it was unwrapped. So um, this is what sort of the raw burial uh, bundle would look like with these sort of plain textiles on the outside. And then within, we've got, or on top of this, we've got hats. We've got some um, decorative feathers. And then as these uncolored layers were removed, we start to find these colored layers. And again, a headband and a headdress. And then more layers removed and more of these colorful decorated textiles. And finally, down to the basket with the remains inside. So very complicated, very intensive um, work to make these textiles, which were then used to so this is an example, this is from the Brooklyn Museum, this is the Caracas mantle. They were generally called mantles as if they were blankets that you would wear over your shoulders. But one of the things that pictures don't always tell the story of is just how large these textiles were. 
So I want everybody to kind of fix in your mind how big you think this is. Like, is this a baby blanket size? Is this twin, queen, king size? Okay, everybody have sort of an idea of how big you think it is? Was it that big? Almost 10 feet long? Really large head size. So, 9 feet, 10 and 8 inch wide. And then, look at the detail. So, how many colors do we see? Well, we see some black and it's not really clear in this picture. There's reds and there's yellows. Where do these colors come from? How do you make these colors? Well, let me zoom in a little bit and here's some of the detail. So, these, I'm not sure what they are. They're not fish, right? Because they've got a leg. These were some kind of ritual or um, supernatural beings, probably. And you can see some of the decomposition of the textile. These are actually preserved very well on the south coast because it's so dry. And because they were in these tubes and wrapped in these bundles, so many of these textiles survive. All right, let's zoom in a little more. Now how many colors do we see? How many more colors? And more colors. And details. And the fringe, and then more details. Now you can actually see that this is blue, but the background is black. And it's all outlined in this tiny hand stitch for the pink. Look at how detailed that is. Isn't that incredible? This was one textile. And how many are in those bundles? Tens, dozens. So, textiles. Um, the Chavin are sort of given the first um, credit for these elaborate textiles, and they become more and more elaborate with embroidery. So all of this detail is embroidered. So this is one from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Um, so this textile is about the same size as the other one. Now, the fabric itself, the ground cloth here, is generally made from locally grown native cotton. So cotton is native to um, this sort of coastal region of South America. The embroidery, because cotton doesn't take color the same way, um, the embroidery though is in camelid wool. So when we think wool, we think it comes from sheep. But in South America, they didn't have sheep, instead they had camels, llamas, alpacas, guanaco, uh, vicuña. And so this wool is generally thought to have been imported from the highlands of Peru. And so if it was found on the coast, clearly there was trade, except that now there's some question that maybe people were raising camelids on the coast and that they had adapted to that environment. So these are preserved, again, because of this dry climate and mostly from berries. So this is a detail of the um, shaman figures that are on this. Their heads are thrown back and they're all carrying a knife and a mace. So incredible detail again. Try and count the colors in this one textile, right? All of these had to be made from locally available materials. All right. So what are the questions that the archaeologists and the museums bring to us? Well, they want to know how old are these textiles. Like they may have some idea of how old they are, but sometimes they want to know, well, when we have these layers of textiles in a burial, how do they compare to each other in age? Um, or they have like a little fragment and they want to know, how old is this piece? Is this real? Did this maybe come from the tourist trade in the 1920s? Or is this an authentic material that came from a burial in Peru in the past? Um, what materials were used? What were the wools? What, what was the cotton? Where did it come from? What processes were used to manufacture these textiles? We know how they were woven. We know that the um, Indian people today are still craftspeople who produce this incredible textile art. Um, where did they get their materials? Where did the dyes come from? Were they locally available? Did they trade to acquire things that were more beautiful or more interesting? What about all those other grave goods? So we can get some more information from human remains, but my research lab doesn't study anything with human remains. We only look at materials. And, but if other people are studying that, and we're studying the textiles, we can put all this information together, and we can build a deeper, more um, clear understanding of what people were doing in the ancient past. So 
let's, let's look at some of the materials that have been used for dyeing in the past. So for thousands of years, the only materials we had for making our clothing colorful were natural materials. So um, we might think of mineral pigments, and if you've ever fallen in um, volcanic mud, like I did when I went to Hawaii many years ago, you can't ever get that out. And in fact, you can buy t-shirts that are stained with that red mud. Um, and that is very definitely a way that you can get color from uh, mineral pigment. Um, dyes, on the other hand, we tend to describe as organic materials. And so most of these come from plants, but we can also get them from insects and even mollusks. So this is a Muricidae snail from the Middle East, and this is where the famous uh, royal purple that the Romans used, and that you may have heard of before, Tyrian purple that the city of Tyre was well known for. Um, it takes something like 10,000 of these to dye one toga, so very, very intensive process. So let's look at the chemistry of some of the materials that come from these plants. Before we do that, I want to talk about sort of where we went after um, natural dyes, and that was to synthetic dyes. So, any synthetic organic chemists in the audience? Not today? Okay. Some of you maybe have seen some of this, or you know someone who's a synthetic organic chemist. Um, all of our synthetic organic chemistry of dyes comes back to Perkins' discovery of Moby. And so, this was a famous purple dye that came from coal tar. Um, the process isn't particularly well understood, it was sort of serendipitous, but it became very popular. So, um, after 1856, dyes started to become synthetic because they were cheaper and easier to make, which led to environmental issues as well. Um, no good deed goes unpunished these days, uh, or even in 1856. Now, Moby itself is kind of a relic of history, and there was this paper and featured in CNN News a few years ago um, about studying the Mobine in Queen Victoria's stamps from the 1850s. And so this was um, people going back and trying to find this historic dye in um, materials where we know it should exist, but can we characterize it and find it? All right, so matter. Matter is probably the most famous and most important of the red dyes. Um, it's been used since antiquity. Uh, Tutankhamun's tomb has textiles that were dyed with matter root, uh, native to Turkey and the Middle East. Uh, it was the red prior to 1869 when synthetic alizarin became available. So here's a molecule of alizarin. This is an anthraquinone. And um, so if we think about red prior to 1869, some of the examples of this would be the red coats are coming. Well, how are their coats red? They were dyed with matter. And a very long and complicated process probably to make something called turkey red. And um, dyes during this time period were so complex, they were made with rancid oil and sulfuric acid and all kinds of unbelievable things in the recipes. Um, they're really interesting recipes, let's say. Um, Persian rugs are also an example of things that were made with matter. So these are two of the anthroquinones that are characteristic of matter dyes. So alizarin is the primary one. Now, there's other reds, and these reds, there are other plants that produce red as well, but some of the most common other types of reds come from insects. Anybody ever hear about bug juice when you were a kid? Yeah, red Kool-Aid. Oh, we called it bug juice. Hmm, everybody was like, eh, there's no bugs in it. Um, those bugs were the coaxial insects. So these are the dry bodies of the Dacolobius coaxus insects. And these are native to Mexico. They were widely used in um, Mexico and Central America to make red dyes. And from some of the things that I've read, it said that the Spanish actually the second most valuable commodity to come out of the New World to, uh, to the old was cochineal for dyeing. So, um, had I brought my cochineal insects with me, but I forgot them yesterday, um, I can take one of these insects and turn an entire liter of water pink in just a few seconds. This is an incredibly strong dye. It does not take very much to give lots of color. 
So um, they became very popular, spread all over the world. Um, there are other materials that are available in other places. Lac is named in India. Um, this is the same insect that we get shellac from. So the resinous part is used as a um, coating, and then you can extract this anthraquinone dye out as well. Um, the other one I want to mention is these Kermes lice uh, that are characteristic are from uh, the Mediterranean. These are found in more European materials, but I want to mention them because the chemistry of Cochineal and uh, Kermes are kind of interesting. So, carminic acid is this color that comes from the cochineal insects. And so the only difference between the main colorants is this one has sugar, so this is a glycoside molecule, and carminic acid is lacking that. Now, you can convert this into this relatively simply. And so it's not a clear marker of carminic, but if you don't find any carminic acid, it can be indicative. The carmine is still used as a dye in food and very often in cosmetics. It's really popular in lipsticks in particular. So if you look at a food label and you see carmine or cochineal extract, that was pretty clear, or natural red number four, that colorant is derived from cochineal insects. So natural, grab that buzz. So some of the things you read on the internet are actually true. Not many of them, but some of them. All right, so let's move on to blue. And so um, indigo, which was named because it was native to India and found there first, uh, is the most common. So if you have this indigo dye and you try to make a solution out of it, it doesn't work. It just floats on the top. It doesn't dissolve in water at all. Um, Woad is a similar plant. Um, instead of an indigofera, it's like status. This is native to Europe and widely used in northern climates. Um, so if you remember the movie Braveheart, um, or Picts who painted themselves blue, woad was the colorant in that. So um, the Vikings used woad to make blue woad. Now, the chemistry of both woad and indigo is complicated in order to get that color. So those blue jeans that you wear all the time, that color is actually pretty complicated to put onto the clothes. You can't just make a solution and dunk it in there. Okay? It's not like making tea like you would do with mad. So you take the plant and you ferment it to break it down. And over time, you will get this molecule called indican, which again has the sugar on it. This is a colorless solution. And after some more processing and reduction, we can get a solution in doxyl. And this is often referred to as luco indigo or white indigo. It's not white. It's sort of a greenish gray color. But it's soluble in water. So you take your cotton material, you dump it into this solution, which is both very basic and um, strongly producing. I can go to my shelf in my lab and grab a bottle of sodium dithionate to do the reduction. If you need basic and reducing conditions, a long time ago, you were combining things like animal dung and collecting urine. And dyers were not popular people because they, their jobs smelled terrible. Um, the dyers and the tanners were usually stuck off on the edges of town together. There's a reason for that. So um, this whitish green solution, you dunk your stuff into it and then you pull it out. And as you shake it in the air, or usually when I rinse it under um, aerated water, the color turns blue. And the reason for that is that this molecule rearranges into this upon oxidation. And so we can link two of these together to make indigotin, which goes from this mostly colorless solution to the deep blue that we're used to seeing on death. So not only were these Peruvian artists artists, but somebody had to be a chemist figuring this out. How do I turn this plant into a solution magically makes my textiles blue, right? It would look like magic if you don't know what's going on. So these are the questions that we've been asked. This is a collection of many different projects um, over several years. And so our initial project was to study just the red yarns from the Paracas mummy bundles to confirm with a new technique if these were actually dyed with a red, this sort of a distant relative of matter called robudium. We also looked at some materials from a Peruvian, um, a collection of Peruvian dye plants and um, reference samples that were made from those plants. 
And then the Michael C. Carlos Museum at Emory University asked us to look at some of their textiles to study the secondary colors. So red, blue, and yellow are primary colors. And they were interested in orange, the green, and the purple to determine were these you know, just shifts somehow of the main colors? Were they mixtures? Were they over dyeing? Were they mixing the dyes together to make the color? And that was the idea for that project, was to try and determine that. Later, um, Renee Sign, the conservator at the Carlos, came to me and said, well, we have this really interesting Lombayeque textile. Do you think you could look at that? I said, oh, Renee, I'm teaching so much this semester. And what we did was we turned this into what's called a cure, um, a curriculum-based undergraduate research experience. And so my instrumental analysis class undertook the technical study of this Lombayeque textile. Everybody got their two samples, we looked at them under the microscope, we ran them by SEM, and then they gave presentations in one of our local conferences. So we learned a lot about the textile, but the students learned a lot about doing an actual project that someone really cared about. This wasn't just, hey, let's get some results and see what happens, but we had to then report this back to the museum. And so they were um, beholden to the museum to care for these samples, to understand the process of doing the analysis. And then finally, to round out the study of the secondary colors, we added some um, Paracas mummy materials in with that. So how do we identify dye colorants in historic textiles? So there's, there's a couple of things that we have to worry about. First of all, the samples that we're going to be allowed to take are necessarily going to be pretty small. Ideally, conservation or conservators would like me to go in with my magic wand, wave it over top of something, and tell them everything they want to know. How old is it? Where did it come from? What's it made out of? And everything else. Well, that's not how science works. Kind of seems to work that way on TV, though, right? Like CSI, we get a thing, we put it in the box, the thing tells us the answer after it goes to date, right? That's not really how science works. Except I'm going to show you one that almost works that cool. So, kind of be looking forward to that. So, this is kind of like, if they had their choice, that's all they'd give me. So this is the end of our tweezers. This is one fiber. Not a yarn spun together. This is one fiber. <sighs> OK, and well, they kind of like us to give it back when we're done. Although if they give us one fiber, they're probably OK. Very first time we tried this, it was very nerve wracking because we were trying to run the sample, and it went and sucked into the mass spectrometer. And it was gone forever. <laughs> 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 Oops. That wasn't good. We got better at holding our samples after that. Much more careful. Now, as I said with the um, cochineal, one bug, get a lot of color from that. Um, so what we call that is a high tinting strength. So not a lot of molecules to get a lot of color. Hmm. Okay, so that means that there's not going to be a lot of molecules there for us to detect, even though we can see it and see that there's lots of color. What technique are we going to be able to use for that? So we need analytical chemistry methods that are sensitive, that are specific, and ideally magic. Oh, I mean non-destructive. Uh, there are non-destructive techniques that can tell you a lot about textiles. There's portable x-ray fluorescence. There's um, fiber optic reflective spectroscopy that can give you a lot of information. Can't tell you everything. No instrument is magic. Um, I think my students have a t-shirt that has that as a quote from me. Um, no instrument is magic. We have limitations. So what can we do with this? So we want to be minimally destructive, at least. And ideally, we might get something like that, which my students start going to freak out because I'm like, oh, look at the huge sample they gave us this time. Because that's actually pretty big for what we need to do. All right. So the standard way that most museums study um, textile dyes is with high performance liquid chromatography. So chromatography started as a way to separate colors from the pigments in leaves. Um, and now we use chromatography, liquid chromatography, to study everything from PFOS in the environment to um, using it to make sure that drugs are pure in a manufacturing facility. Very, very important technique, very powerful technique. So separation and identification, or dark mass spec. So dark is what we have in our lab and what we've been using the most. What this allows us to do is direct analysis of the yarn sample with no preparation. We don't have to do any extraction or injection or wait for the separation, which means that there's a trade-off. If it's fast, we're probably not going to get all of the information. 
So there's um, pros and cons to everything. We can actually run that single fiber that the um, conservator wants to give us, as long as we hold on to it tightly. Um, the signal may be affected by the mordant, so how the dye is prepared can affect whether or not we can see this molecule. And that is sort of a new-ish method. Um, it's, it hasn't been very widely used in conservation science, but now there's one at the Smithsonian, and the scientists there have been doing quite a bit of work with it. Um, we've got it, and it's starting to sort of spread into Europe, so hopefully there'll be even more um, being done with uh, heritage materials soon. Now, one of the downsides is that if you know about mass spectrometry, you know that we take the molecule, we smash it apart, and we look at the pieces to build up a fingerprint of the structure of the molecule. And while we can do that, if we do that for a whole bunch of molecules at once, which is what we're doing with DART, you just get kind of a sea of a mess. And so we might, we might be able to fish something out of that with statistics, but if we're just trying to get a quick answer, it's going to make it way too complicated. So liquid chromatography requires us to extract the sample into solution to get the dyes in solution. And we generally need a whole lot more than just one fiber, because we need that 20 microliters wherever we're going to inject. Um, the extraction protocol can actually break that mordant and dye bond. So mordant is something that helps the dye bite into the fiber. And I'll show you some examples of that here in a minute. If we break that bond, we can get more of the dye into solution. So this gives us a stronger signal. Um, it's very widely used, so it's not the new kid on the block, and people are like, mm, I don't know about that. Is that really going to work? And then we use the diode array detection to give us a UV vis spectrum, which is very useful for these colored molecules. So we can kind of get a fingerprint. Uh, one of my students calls it a smudgy fingerprint because it's not really identifying, but it can definitely tell you is it this or is it that. So this is direct analysis in real time. This allows us to do mass spectrometry of small molecules, anything less than a thousand dollars, um, without any sample preparation. And so here's the ion source. And here's the orifice into the mass spectrometer, and this is an air gap. This is just a gap, open air in the lab. This is an ambient ionization technique. So we make ions in the air, and then we send them into the mass spectrometer. So we can use this for any of these types of things in archaeological chemistry. I'm only going to be talking about the dyes and organic colorants today, but we can look at residues and ceramics that can tell us about food and beverages that people ate in the past. Um, accumulated surfaces. We had a paper on that a few years ago looking at material that had been added to an African mask that was crumbling off and what that composition was. Um, looking at mining media or conservation treatments on paintings. This is possible with that. And if we want to look at bigger molecules that DART can't do directly, we can do some sample prep and then we have access to those molecules. So DART is very fast. I'm going to give you an example of how fast it is. There's no solvent required, no sample prep, and we don't need a lot of material. But we do have to heat the sample. Um, if we don't heat the sample, we don't knock the molecules off and into the air where they can be ionized. Um, we're limited to things about 1,000 Daltons, and that depends on how strongly they're bound to the fiber. There's no separation, and it's not magic. It does require us taking a sample. All right. So let's skip over Peru for a second and go to southern Ohio. So um, just recently, many of the mound sites in southern Ohio were designated as a World Heritage Site. And the site mound um, is one of those sites within the World Heritage Site. So many years ago, we were given some materials from the Ohio History Commission to determine what the dye was in this. And the, there's not a lot of textiles preserved in North America, and when they are, they're often just these little bits and fragments. And unfortunately, when these sites were excavated in the 1920s, most of them were just like, yeah, I don't know what that stuff is. They were just sort of thrown away. So there's a little box at the Ohio History Connection that has little bits and pieces that were found afterward and sort of clumped together. And so this is what we were given um, were some of these materials. And the question there wasn't, can you tell us what dye it is? But it was a very specific question. Can you tell us if this was dye made from bed straw or dye made from blood root? So um, keep an eye out if you're walking on any trails that have sort of open forests, and you will see blood root, 
which is native to this area, as well as that drop. So this might look familiar to anybody who does gardening. If you've ever been trying to pull weeds in your garden and you get that sticky weed, the stuff that like clings to you, cleavers is what they call it in Europe, um, that is a gallium species and it's closely related to that. <coughs> if you can pull it out really carefully, you'll see tiny little bright orange roots. And you can make a dye from gallium apurine, but it's going to take you a wheelbarrow load of roots to be able to do something like that. Blood root, on the other hand, has a really thick root that when you break it, oozes what looks like blood. Well, I guess that's where it got its name, right? It oozes this dark red color. And so there was kind of an argument in the literature that, well, who would pick something this tiny and small and labor intensive when you can just pick some of this plant and there's obviously dye oozing right out of it when you look at it. Okay, well, they have different chemistry. So this is a relative of matter, distant relative, but the main colorant is an anthroquinone. This one's called purpur. Whereas blood root, the main compound, is this, benzyl, um, this alkaloid compound that's called sanguinary. So all of this comes back to blood. So since the chemistry is very different, we could run these by dart and we could try and find out, well, which one's which. So how do we do this? This is an example of the sample size that we need. And this is quite literally a gigantic sample for us. That is the tip of a ballpoint pen. Okay, this is the end of our tweezers. This is a reference sample that we made with blood root. And so this is a gigantic clump of wool that we run at 450 degrees of the dart ion source. This is what's left afterwards. Some of it has burned up, some of it has blown away, but it's still there. So we could go back and do another analysis on it. Now, what's the process between here and here? Well, this is the um, final result. This is the spectrum that we get. And so we see sanguinarine, norsanguinarine, all of these compounds are these benzoisoquinolin alkaloids. So how do we get from one to the other? So this is the process of running a sample. I'll apologize in advance. It's a little noisy from the sound of the mass bag. Oh, no, there's no sound. That's fine. OK, so you saw the sample. And I'm going to hold it in the ion source. Think there's the signal for sanguinarine and norsanguinarine. I take the sample out, and the signal goes away. I hold it back into the ion source, and there comes the signal back. So I just ran the sample twice. If you've ever run an HPLC, to run the HPLC to separate these dyes takes about an hour. Plus it's an hour to extract the sample, or overnight, depending on how much material you have. It takes a long time. If I just want to know, is this a lizard, or is this um, bed straw, or blood root, it should be really easy to tell the difference just with part. So that's what we did. So here are the compounds that are characteristic of blood Here are the compounds that are characteristic of bed straw. And so we ran our three samples that were provided from Ohio History Connection, and we found no evidence, no significant evidence for blood um, Then we started looking for the lizarin, xanthopurpurin, and purpurin, and what we found is that yes, all of these samples contain at least a little bit of those compounds where we found none of the blood red. So we can confirm that bed straw was used in this particular textile from the site mount group. So there's your Ohio content for today. Um, now we have to jump to some of the other things. So let's go back to Peru. And other people have done these studies, mostly with HPLC, to show that through time, we see this progression from these plant reds based on um, matter relatives, robotium, all the way up to cochineal sort of replacing it. Because cochineal, you get much stronger, deeper red colors. And it's not as intensive to um, do the processing. All right, so here's robunium. This is, a, um, this is the plant, robunium hypocarpium. There are thicker red roots here. And this dye, this sample, was prepared with that root. And um, the plant is native to Peru. And the primary colorants, the xanthopurpurin is sort of a question now because we see this really easily by dart, but we don't see it in the HPLC the same way, so maybe we're misidentifying the molecule. But purpurin is the primary component. 
And when we looked at the Paracas red samples that we had from one of these mantles and some of the, um, or two mantles and some embroidery on turbans, uh, we found that yes, these were strongly colored with this Robunium plant, consistent with what previous people had done and seen by other methods. Well, the reference sample that we had was from what was called the Saltzman Collection. And when I gave a presentation on our initial work at UCLA, a student came to me and said, you know, we have Saltzman's collection of materials that brought me this book. And um, another colleague, uh, Perla Colomini at um, the University of Pisa, and I got permission and we took samples from these to build up an analysis database to say, you know, these are things we know what they are, this is what we detected, and if you find materials, you can use this for comparison. So we did our characterizations by DART, um, another method called paper spray, which I'll talk about here in a second, um, and Parallel's group did both the LCDAD and the LCMSMS to get a complete characterization. So we published that in 2019, and lots of weird things happened during the pandemic. But one of the weird things that happened to me was I got this email out of the blue from a woman named Kay Antonio Semeolo. And I knew her name because she has one of the most widely cited papers in all of Peruvian dye research because her thesis was on Peruvian dye plants. And so she has this listing of all these Peruvian dye plants and where they grow and what they were used for. So this person emails me Nobody had heard from her in a very long time. Turns out she went on and became a high school teacher, and then she retired, and she still grows dye plants at her house in California. But we had this long conversation. She's like, you know, back in the 70s, Max Saltzman hired me on a grant to go to Peru and drive around and collect these plants. And while I was collecting the plants, Alongside the road with my tiny little camp stove and my giant um, ceramic mug, not ceramic, enamel mug, I made all those dyes. I was like, really? Well, first of all, we had to change our paper. We called it the Saltzman Collection, so we published a correction right away to give her the credit for this. And then you can see, this is what she's found just recently, in the past few years. She still has all of this stuff sitting around in her house. And she shared it with us so that we could actually have the samples from the person. And then she was going through more stuff because she got so excited about this. Last year I got a package and my department secretary um, asked if it was from a muggle because it was completely covered with stamps. And so if you've seen the Harry Potter movies, um, you know, people mail things, it's just, it's just enough stamps. So uh, it contained samples of her botanical collection. So now we have the original plants, the dyes she made from them, and we can do the full characterization of all of that. Eventually, when we have time, that's the plan next. That's the plan next. So, um, what did we get from studying these? Well, if we look at the reds, these are three different species of Robudium that she collected. And so, you see the purpurin is the most common in most of these. This one seems to have some of this, whatever 239 comes out in a negative ion mode, but purpurin is also there. And um, this is a gallium that was actually named for Kay because she was the first one to find it in South America. And um, again, the galliums and robuniums are very closely related. In fact, they've swapped names a couple of times now because of the classifications changing. So we have this good characterization of the molecules that we expect to see, whether it's by darts or paper spray or LC with diode array. Now this is a piece of one of the textiles from the Carlos. And um, each one of these is a hummingbird. So you can see the long beaks. If you've ever watched a hummingbird in a hummingbird feeder, what does it do? They swing back and forth. Like they're trying to protect their territory. They don't want anybody else to come in. You know what else swings back and forth? The shuttle on a loom. So hummingbirds were a very important um, image in Peruvian uh, art and textile. So each one of these little hummingbirds is about an inch and a half tall. And they're crocheted. They're not flat, they're three-dimensional. They're three dimensions. And this was all border on a larger plain blue cloth. 
So we were interested in the purple, so we took a tiny, tiny little piece of the purple, and that's about the kind of material that we get. So this isn't the whole sample, because we're looking at it very closely under the microscope, but you can see how fine this animal hair is, this wool is. So when we studied this, we were looking at, well, did other cultures also use Robunium besides the Paracas? And so we had our reds and purples from a uh, hummingbird, and yes, we found the in that. Um, we also had a um, sort of looped band, look kind of like a, um, could have been a headband or something like that. And so, yes, during the Nazca, which immediately followed on from the Paracas, and there was some overlap. Yes, they were still using rubidium. For the watery textiles, which were later into the middle horizon, we didn't expect to see this because the wari supposedly had switched over all to cochineal. But what we found was in these discontinuous warp and weft textiles, which are made in this really complex way, and then taken apart, tie-dyed, and then put back together. This is not cut like a um, quilt. These aren't cut pieces that are then sewn together. These are actually woven in this complex pattern on a loose loom and then removed, dyed, put back, and then looped together. Very complicated. I still don't quite understand it. So these ones actually contained robunium, which was different and unexpected. We didn't know what to make of that. We still don't really know what to make of that because we need more samples to see if this is true everywhere, just in the two samples that we looked at. So um, we didn't find any robunium in those other wari textiles. So what we were looking for was a cochineal. And so here's our carminic acid again. We can't ionize this by dart, so instead we extract this um, dye into solution and we run it by paper spray. This is another one of these ambient ionization techniques. We take a little triangle of filter paper, literally just cut out a piece of filter paper. You clip it into an alligator clip, which is powered by the electrospray source, and you effectively turn that piece of filter paper into an electrospray. And so you put your solution on that, and it sprays off and ionizes, and you get the spectrum of the carminic acid. Now, we mostly see the carminic acid with the sodium adduct because there tends to be a lot of sodium around, and you can see this is the darker red color. So we see in the wari textiles, this um, darkish red had um, carminic acid. This uh, salmon color was also carminic acid. How do you get those two different colors from the same dye? We don't really know. There's still so much to figure out about these. And then this is the Lambayeque textile that my students studied in their instrumentation class. You can see how complex this is with all the different colors. And this is actually the back side. So there's something the um, curator has incredible knowledge about this, but so much of the iconography was hidden. And that was part of how it was made and how it was intended. So the tassels and pink squares here both contain carminic acid as well. So that was consistent with what we expected to find. So when we compare these, what kind of information do we get? Well, here's the paper spray for cochineal. If we do HDLC, we see basically one giant peak for the carminic acid, and we can confirm that that's carminic acid based on the UV biz spectrum. If we look at robonium, we see these compounds in the darts. We get sort of a main compound peak for purpurin, and we can match this up to our purpurin standard. So all of these techniques really work best when used together so that we can get the maximum amount of information. So here's one of these discontinuous warp and weft textiles, the other one we studied. And so we already know that the red was robunium. The undyed or tied off areas where this had been um, puckered and tied with a string to make these tie dye regions had no dye. The yellow, we couldn't really say what it was, but have you ever gotten a grass stain on something? Anything can be a yellow dye. If it's a plant, it probably can be a yellow dye. And so the just huge number of things that it could be makes it really complicated to identify. The green was indigo mixed with the same kind of yellow that we still don't know for sure what it is. And then we have this blue, and it looks blue or black but we could tell that it was purple because we had a sample that looked like this from the edge. So this was actually red. This whole corner was dyed red. So parts of it were tied off and are the natural color of the bowl. And then the whole thing was dyed red. 
And then this piece is removed and dyed with the blue to get the red underneath the purple. Or the blue, which gives you purple. So this was one of our secondary colors where we could actually say, looking at the sample, it was red and then over dyed with indigo to make it blue. All right, so the yellows are really complicated, like I said. It's very hard to figure out what's going on. And so there's only one here that's really important. And this is the Biden's Andy Cola, and we're going to look at that in a second. So this was a gold embroidered thread from one of the Caracas textiles. And the top trace is the Biden's Andy Cola that Kay made in the field in <coughs> Peru back in the 1970s. And this is a much, much weaker trace of the 2000 and something year old dye that was in this piece of yarn. If we look at the dark spectra, this is from the sample, this is from the reference material, and so we can see that these same compounds come up. And Deviant and Ocanon are pretty unique in that instead of being flavanols, flavonoids, these are uh, chalcones, and they're characteristic of some very specific plants. So we confirm this with HPLC by looking at the UV vis spectrum and at the retention times. And so we feel pretty confident in that identification of one sample in the whole thing for the yellows. We had one that we were really able to say for sure what we thought it could be. So this was the progression. So we go from Caracas to Chiang South Coast, South Coast, Central, and um, Central. And we see that Robunium is replaced with Cochineal. But this sort of reddish brown was also Robunium. So that was sort of a asterisk. Interesting. You need to follow up on that. Blue is always indigo. Green is always indigo with the flavonoid. Here's our one that we identified pretty much for sure. Our oranges could be mixtures of Robunium and the flavonoid, or just Robunium alone, or even just Cochineal alone. So there was something different going on with the chemistry there. Uh, the browns are usually pretty difficult too because they can often be tannins, but we did find one that had some of those ocanins as well. So maybe, or the chalcones as well. So maybe that was related to the yellow. So how do we change a red into an orange? Well, one of the things we can do, we can do this with pH, so we can change the pH of the solution. Or we can change the metal that's holding the dye molecule onto the fiber. So cotton is cellulose. The metal chelates between the um, molecule of dye and the structure. And so this, depending on what the metal is, will shift the color around. And the same thing is true if we have the same molecule on um, wool. So here's our protein structure of the wool, and that metal is connected to that. How different? This is all cochineal dye. I wanted to bring these with me, and I forgot them yesterday. I'm sorry. I wish I brought them so you could see them in person. This is, this is all the same concentration of cochineal dye. This is with aluminum used as the mordant, and you get this red. If you use copper, you get purple, because the copper imparts some blue color too. Tin gives you this sort of fluorescent pink. Chromium, which is more modern mordant, but you can get these sort of fuchsia colors. But look at what iron does. It takes that brilliant red color and the official um, term for this in dyeing is saddens the color to gray. So that same bug, you can get all of these different colors just changing the mordant. Well, if we change the pH and the mordant, then we can play around with another whole realm of color. And then it gets even more complicated because it depends on the kind of fiber that we're putting the color on, what color we actually get. And so again, this is all cochineal. This is on sheep's wool, alpaca wool, silk, and cotton. Cotton doesn't take the color the same way. Cotton just doesn't dye the same way. And if you notice that if you, you wash your jeans a few times, they start to fade. Anybody who remembers acid wash from the 80s knows that sometimes we did that on purpose for weird reasons that I don't completely understand. Fashion. So um, the cotton just doesn't hold the dye the same way. It's much, much more difficult. All right, so I want to give you this insight into our weird textile. And what this did is it led us down the path of how much information can we get from one fiber, one piece of yarn. So this was an outlier we didn't even include it in our other study. What we found was that there's probably pigments here. And this orange just confused us. Well, this is what we did. We 
stuck it in the SEM, and we saw this salt on the surface. There's dust all over the surface, and we knew it was heavy, some kind of heavy metal. And the EDF showed us this is mercury sulfide. This is cinnabar paint. This isn't dye. This is a inorganic pigment. We checked it with Raman, and yes, compared to vermilion pigment, also known as cinnabar mineral, we have the same thing. Well, when we ran this by FDIR, we knew it was a cotton fiber, but we saw some protein signal. Oh, if this is paint, it must be stuck there with something prognaceous. Probably egg white, right? Like everybody uses egg to make paint. So I sent it off to a friend who does proteomics, which is studying the um, proteins that are here. And we only have one sample, so it's still kind of tentative. But it looks like blood. There was hemoglobin in there. So now we're like, more samples, more samples, more samples. We've got to figure out what's going on here. It sounds like it could be really exciting, but you always want to assume that you were wrong first and then go back and check. So that's where we are now. So to wrap this all up, the archaeological chemistry of Peruvian dyes and textiles. People use the local materials and imported materials to make these beautiful, complex colors. They use minerals, they use dirt, they use all kinds of different things to make all of these different colors. When we do the analysis, we don't get a lot of material. And some methods give us answers that are fast and don't require us to do much. Others are more comprehensive and give us a lot more information, but they take a lot more time. And so overall, the point of all of this is to understand the dyes and the colors and the technology and the techniques to better connect with these ancient artists in ancient Peru. So with that, I will acknowledge my students here who were um, posing and getting late for a photo with the dart. And the rest of my research group, um, all of our funding agencies, and all of the many, many people who have made these projects possible. And with that, I also thank you. We haven't done any of that yet. We haven't done any of that yet. 
Um, there is, we just haven't, there's no money in this, so we don't, you know, you're not going to get a million dollar grant to look at old textiles, not the U.S. Not, not, NSF doesn't really have, you know, a directorate for really old stuff. There's the archaeometry, but they have a very, very tiny budget. We're still working on that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of things that we could do, and sometimes people do, but it's often in isolation. And so I think if we can take these small materials and get more information and start sharing that, you know, instead of being in these silos of this museum did this study and this museum did that study, bringing all of that together, maybe we can start accessing some of that and getting people to use all of these techniques to better understand that. So, yeah, if you want to delve into the technology, we're going to have to do some things like that for sure. Yeah? No, you. Um, when I see on TV weavers, it's mostly females. Is this a female? It, it seems to be, but it's not completely clear. Um, the um, Navajo, the men are the weavers. So while we think about there being maybe gender differences or sex roles on some of these things, we don't know for sure what people were doing in the past. Um, this is some of the work that Ann Paul had done in the past. She was an art historian and anthropologist, was looking at how many hands were needed to make one of these incredibly large textiles. She was looking at things like, there are areas where there's an absolutely perfect um, embroidery. And then the ones on the sides next to it are a little bit wonky. And so they think the master did this part and then handed it off to the apprentices who did the next ones to try and copy that. Um, there's an incredible amount of sort of technical work that's, been gone, that's gone into that. But how do we find the hand of the artist? How do we identify who that artist was? I think that's lost of time. I don't think we know for sure. Um, a lot of people, and I think, but I, I don't know for sure, a lot of people were buried with work baskets. So the Chankai samples that I mentioned, those were all from a um, weaving work basket. And these were pretty common. So the artist was probably buried with their own materials. And so they can look at, you know, understanding who was buried with that. Um, I think that's mostly women, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, yeah in the back. When, when did those uh, shaft tombs or burial sites date to? One, um, one and, and two, the indigo dyes, which are the oldest found. Mm -hmm. um, um, where, how do I ask the question? Anyway, I'll back up to the map. Well, I, I understand where they were found, yeah. but... but were they found in burials as well, those indigo? Uh, I don't know if the Waka Prieta was a burial. I think so, but I'm not sure. Um, it's been a long time since I reviewed that paper. Um, but so the Paracas time period was about 2,000 years ago, almost back to 3,000 years ago. Um, the Waka Prieta textile was dated to about 6,000 years old. And I would assume that most of these are found in burials, but um, it, it really depends on where they're found. Some cases they were found in sort of public areas, so they may have been like wall hangings. Um, again, this was the communication form. There was no written communication, and so um, communication through iconography was very important. So I don't know if that aims towards answering your question. And the shaft tombs? Oh, the shaft tombs, those were Paracas. So these date back to about um, almost 3,000 years ago. Yeah? What were the more metals used? How did they get those metals? So we make them out of, you know, we, we go to the stock room and we grab a jar of iron sulfate. Um, often these were made from naturally occurring ores. Um, a lot of times they were like black mud. Um, we don't know for sure where they came from. The best we really have is we find iron in this sample. The sample is brown and it's disintegrating. And so we're pretty sure that means there's a tan dye and iron mordant because that's how we make iron gall ink. So iron gall ink is what everybody used to write on everything in like the 18th century, 
And this is why so many documents are decomposing, because iron gall ink decomposes to turn into acid. And it dissolves away the parchment, or in this case, the wool. So um, I had a friend who worked at the Library of Congress, and the original constitution was actually <laughs> encapsulated in plastic in like the 1930s, because it seemed like a great idea to preserve it. And if you look through it, you can see that there's giant holes where the ink has eaten away the parchment that it was written on. So um, we kind of know from modern technology, from the decomposition, what some things were used. Um, where they got them, the best we have is sort of ethnographic evidence of people talking to um, dyers and weavers. There's a lot of um, chronicles from the Spaniards that they talk about, you know, this is how they made it, and they used this particular mud in this particular bath, and that would impart, it, we would be looking at things like aluminum or iron or something like that. Um, I think it was just, we know to use this material to get this color, and, um, you know, it's, it's us projecting back the chemistry, trying to figure out, well, where did they get that from? Um, it was all going to be from the natural world. Um, some plants, you can actually use um, tannins as mordants as well. But it will also shift the color because you're adding that sort of brown color into that. To complicate all of this, not all wool is white. There's browns and dark browns and beiges. And so you could probably get that same color or differences in color just by starting with different colors of wool and adding the dyes to that and you end up with a whole range of shades. So. Yeah, it's, it's very fun to start playing with dyes. So the first thing I start my undergrads on is, hey, let's go make some dyes, because then they can really get into it, and then once they see it, they want to play with more. Yeah. You, you remarked that it was males doing the Navajo dyeing or weaving, weaving. Mm -hmm. and is that contemporary or historical? Uh, I believe it's contemporary, but I, I don't know for sure. Um, that's literally from my parents living in New Mexico for a year that I remember that. I'm not by any means a weaving expert at all. 